Good morning and welcome to Sierra Community Church, everybody. We're so glad you're here this morning. We have beautiful snow falling outside for everyone who's online with us. We're happy that you're here too. We hope some of you are joining us that couldn't make it in. Let's stand wherever you find yourselves. Let's stand. Let's talk about and praise God for his love that is so powerful. It changes our lives. Let's worship him. powerful so strong and he is yes amazing he is so amazing Romans 8 37 through 39 says no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord
talking in Ephesians this week and this song came to me. It's a new song so I'm sorry about that but it's just so good. It comes right from Ephesians 3 17 and 18 and it's from the prayer um, that Paul prays for the Ephesians. It says and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how high how wide how long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God just join with us as you learn this song
Jesus. That is what we pray this morning as we come before your throne, God. We thank you that you allowed all of this, everything that's happened in our lives, God. We can't even imagine what you're going to do with our past, our present, our future, God. You have more planned than we could ever imagine, and I thank you for that truth. Thank you that you gave it to Paul to tell the Ephesians that long ago, and I thank you that it's still true for us today, God. So we just want to surrender our lives to you, Jesus. Ask that your love would just overflow in this place and that it would be that powerful love that we know it is, that it would change our hearts to love and desire to worship you more, understand your character better, God, so we can trust you. So we give all this up in your name, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Great job worshiping, guys. Amen. It is such a blessing to be here and to sing with you guys. It just brings so much joy to my life, so thank you. And I'm, yes, I, I'm sorry you get me for announcements, so that, that is a downside, but. <laughs> so we have some really exciting things coming up. Our church is so awesome and supports our family so well. The first thing that we've been telling, it's at this Friday, so make sure if you haven't signed up parents with kids, this is a date night for you to get uh, get a night out with your, with your husband or wife and um, drop the kids off here, and Nick and his team of volunteers will watch them. It's, it's such a fun night for the kids too. My kids never want to leave when we come to pick them up. So it's a, it's a good night. You can email Nick or talk to him this morning, nick at sierra.church to sign up for that. It's this Friday, 6 to 8.30. So make sure you get signed up for that if you haven't. The next thing is for fathers with, kid, with little girls or big girls. It doesn't matter. We've had adult girls go with their dads. It's a really fun night. But there's only two tables left. So dads, if you have not signed up and you want to do that, make sure that you get your tickets um, with Corbin. Corbett at Sierra.Church, or he's here this morning too. You can grab him, flag him down, and and get your table before they run out. Um, $30 a couple. It's such a beautiful night. The girls feel so pampered. They get a flower. They get a special card. It's it's really special. So thank you, Corbett, for always doing that. It's, it's a blessing to have people who really invest into our kids, and the relationships between parents and kids is amazing. And then the last thing is, if you guys want a donation statement for your tax purposes, you can still do that. You can email Jody at Sierra.Church and just ask her for your tax um, your tax information. Otherwise, there's in the round rack out by the front doors, there's a little slip of paper. You can fill it out, drop it in the box next to the door, and she'll get it to you that way as well. All right, that's all we got for announcements, kids. Miss Allie's over here. She'll take you downstairs for kids' church and nursery. Everybody else, let's say good morning to one another.
We're good to go. Got me? Thank you. Hey, Bonnie, how are you? Good. We're all in our places with sunshiny faces. Good morning. Get the rest of you guys sitting down back there. I'll just talk over you. You know, I, I want to tell you an honest, an honest feeling for me on um, these mornings when it's snowing, like the Centennial wasn't bad, you know, a few inches out there. And uh, so a little more uh, people showed up than would have if it had been a foot. I'd like to know where your commitment is based on the inches of snow. But I will say this, um, I really enjoy nine o'clock services. All you that at home are in, in your comfy jammies. Yeah. The real fun's here. Um, anyway, um, that I really enjoy these mornings because it's just, uh, it's a little bit, a little bit more intimate and, uh, it's the people that really want to be together and, uh, I really like that. So thanks. And I'm not really down on you folks in TV land. Good to have you with us this morning. Well, listen, we are in, uh, are already our sixth week of the study of the book of Ephesians. And today's kind of a significant transition in this book, as it were, because uh, we're coming to the end of the three chapters, the first three, and then the last three chapters, four, five, and six, we're, we're entering into. And the first three chapters are these really great truths about what faith in Christ brings to us not only in this life, but particularly spiritually. And, and chapters four through six, which we're going to begin next week when Corbett comes up, is we're going to begin to look at very specific uh, applications uh, of the practice, as it were, of the Christian life. Um, and so what we have here at the very end of this section, chapter three, which is really just intimately tied to chapter one and chapter two and three, they just flow together. I, I read those three chapters again this morning. It is a worthwhile endeavor to just sit down and take 15 minutes of your life and read the most amazing truths about who you are because you believe that Jesus is who he said he is. It's, it's amazing. It's just staggering. So Paul starts this all out at the end of chapter 3 with the prayer that he's been trying to get to, as John shared last week. And, and he says right in the beginning there, for this reason, for this reason, everything that I just told you about this in chapter 1, chapter 2, the first half of chapter 3, it's staggering. This, that God's given us these great things because we've trusted in who his son is. And then Paul writes here, I kneel before the Father. Let me just tell you something. I grew up as a small boy in the Catholic Church, uh, went to catechism on Saturdays, and I was taught how to hold my hands like this, kneel in prayer at my bed at night, never to do this. Had to be, God couldn't hear unless my hands were pointed. And, and so what's interesting is Paul says, I kneel before the Father or I bow before the Father. I, I have to think of him writing this letter in Rome. He was chained to one of the Praetorian Guard. That's how they were kept under house arrest. So here's this guard. Paul just with the chain attached, gets down on his knees and he's praying this prayer. It's no wonder that he tells us at the end of the book of Romans, he greets the members of Caesar's household, which were the guards that guarded him who became believers. Can you imagine the gift of being chained to Paul? So he says, I, I kneel before the Father. There is no conscription for how one prays. Uh, you know, Abraham stood when he prayed over Sodom. Solomon stood when he dedicated the temple. David sat when he prayed over the future of the, the, uh, the nation of Israel, and Jesus fell onto his face when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. So there, there really is no standard for prayer. But here's Paul. He's just overcome, and he just bows before the Father and he says here in verse 15, from whom his whole family, uh, that word family could be translated fatherhood, um, it, meaning by rebirth, you know, we're all part. We all derive our name from the Father in heaven, right? And by rebirth, we're his sons and his daughters. And prior to that rebirth, prior to understanding who Christ was and receiving him in our life, we were children of what? Wrath. I'll read that for you a little bit later. And so he says, I pray out of his glorious riches 
that God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. And I'll talk about all this in a minute. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Right? It's, I know it's, it's almost you read this, you go, what does it all mean? That's why I'm here today. And, and then he says, and I pray to you, I pray that you, speaking to us, having been rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp just how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness in God. And you know, and that phrase surpasses knowledge. I mean, that is, it, it's, it, it's a, it goes beyond the knowingness of our mind. It's something that permeates our entire being, that we know that the love of God in us is a real thing, and it can't be taken from us. And then he closes with this great doxology that, uh, that John used to close with on many sermons, um, as the closing prayer of a sermon. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. According to his power that is work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the, the word of the Lord. So quickly, let me give you a quick, quick overview here what's happening. This is the setup. The end of chapter 3 is the setup of all these practical applications that Paul is going to give for us as followers of Christ, and what, how then should we live? That's chapters 4 through 6, and so this is the, the power setup, as it were, of, of that application and where it comes from. So when he says, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, that he may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul is praying, he says, that the spirit, the Holy Spirit, will it's been given to you when you accept the Christ by faith. But he says, I want him to strengthen you in your inner being, right? This is speaking about the spiritual part of where God dwells in, in humanity. I know this is, we don't think of ourselves this way, but we really have, you know, some components to us. We have our own human will. We have a soul, which is really who we are, our personality, but we also have a spirit. And the spiritual part of us is where God connects with us, and we can speak with God and connect with him, that, that God put that in us right? We, we've often said this, if you watch, mankind was made to worship. And uh, I remember messages in the past where we've showed you clips of people worshiping Michael Jackson, Taylor Swift, or whoever. You know, they're literally on their knees and their hands are in there and they're worshiping somebody because they love their music, you know? Um, we're all made to worship. And we will worship something. More often than not, we worship ourselves. But that, that's the part where God, our spirit, our soul, again, is our personality. Our spirit is where we connect. And this is what he's talking about when he says inner being. You can circle that phrase. It just means the part of you that can connect with God. And he says where God dwells in you and works to control your spiritual being according to his will. Here's the interesting part. The, the, the inner being was lost in sin. That's why there was no connection with God. Until Christ came in and made us alive by what? By faith. So we have this rebirth spiritually. And the scripture tells us, I forgot where it's written, the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed. That's talking about this inner being. This is the part that Paul's praying about that would be strengthened. And he's not saying because we're more suitable to God, because we're doing these things, he says, we, because we believe and trust in Christ. He says, he will dwell in your hearts, what? Through faith. Through your faith. Through your trust. Period. That's what initiates all this. And then the second part of this that he prays for us, he, he tells us that we're grounded in his love. That's, he's done this. This is your foundation, right? This is what the prayer is about. Pastor Warren Wearsby, um, he had, he's written commentaries for years. He's, he's a wonderful guy. I've never got to meet him before. I ever saw him speak publicly, but just a wonderful teacher. He, he told the true story uh, of one of the churches that he pastored, both of them actually in his early years. Uh, they built 
they had building projects. They grew under his leadership, right? And, and the second church was being built over an old lake bed. And he said for weeks, the workers were laying out and pouring these foundations, or doing soil testing first, and then uh, laying out and pouring the footings for what would be the church building. And, and one day, after months of this, Wiersbe complains to the architect and the general contractor, he said, who, he said, gave him the best sermon illustration he had ever heard. He looked at Wiersbe and he said, if you don't first go deep, you can't ever go high. Okay, so that, that's what he's talking about here. That's what he's praying for here. The third thing is that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. There's one of those phrases that you kind of go, okay, what does that mean? Yeah, he's just saying to the fullest extent of your human capacities, particularly in your spirit, that you would overflow with the strength of God's love and knowledge. He says, that's your measuring stick. Not your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who may be weak, and you go, well, I'm doing better than them, <laughs> you know. Rather, you reach for the high bar, yeah. which is God's fullness itself, right? So here's a threefold prayer that he's praying. This is the overview. Strengthen in, the, in, in, the, in our spirit where God moves us and connects with us. Grounded in this amazing love and then filled to the full measure of where God can take you. Now, he's praying for this because now he's going to tell us what to do with it in chapters 4 and 6. But here's the funny part about this. In chapter 1, Paul says that all believers are united with Christ, already have the fullness of Christ in them. That's uh, chapter 1, 3 through 10. In chapter 2, Paul already said that Christians have Christ dwelling in them. That's chapter 2, verse 22. So my question is, why is he praying for people to get what they already have? Well, if you look at the, the message title I put in your notes there, it's kind of a funny way of saying, I, I, a prayer phase of becoming what we already are. That's what Paul's praying about. I want you to become what you already are. And this is the thing we've explained over the years. There is a difference between your position by faith in Christ that God gives you, chapters 1 and 2 of Ephesians, and your practice of that position. At one level, we have these things positionally in Christ. At another level, we haven't fully experienced them. He's actually praying for Christians to seek this out for their life. What Paul is talking about is the difference between having something to be true of you and actually experiencing it. You, that is the Christian life. All this is true of you once you come to Christ by faith. But he wants you to act on it and experience it. He, he's saying that's exactly where mo most Christians are, is that you're loved and accepted in Christ. It's done. But you're not drawing on it. In other words, you're living spiritually poor when infinite wealth is at your disposal. And, and here's part of the evidence of what I'm saying. We pray every Tuesday in our staff meeting from like 10 to, you know, well, we start probably at 1030 until 11 o'clock as a staff. And 98% of the time, we pray for people's health. There are so many people struggling with health, right? Paul doesn't pray for their health. I'm sure they were as sick as we are. Sicker, probably. He doesn't pray for their physical needs. He doesn't ask for anything to do with any of their circumstances, does he? And I'll tell you why. Because he knows if we get this, then we can handle anything. You get this power by faith and work on it. You can handle anything, even death itself. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Paul would write. There is no sting when you know Christ. So this power of the Spirit Paul is praying for us to have is to experience the potential of what we already have been given. It's, and this is just coming off the top of my head right now, it's, it's like you're a 17-year-old kid and 
you're in a PE class in high school, and that day you're doing football as part of your rotation for phys ed, phys ed in high school. And you're a big kid. You're 6'2". You've never had any interest in playing sports, but the, the PE teacher sets up something, and you, gotta, you get to wing a football. And all of a sudden, you get the grip. You're showing how to toss the ball. You already know how to throw a ball. And so then you start throwing the ball. Next thing you know, you're firing balls 30 yards down the field on a rope. And that PE coach gets his cell phone out and he says, to the head football coach, leave your class and get out here. I got something to show you. Okay, so that kid has what? The potential to be a great quarterback, right? But unless he's employing it, the potential is not going to be used, right? So that's what we're talking about here. So what, what exactly is the Spirit is doing? What is the Holy Spirit preparing in your, in your inner being, the spiritual part of you? So you may what? He says that, that you can grasp. This is it. What does it mean to really grow in Christ and to, and to live in a way that I have power to live the life he wants me to live? That I have to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is his love. He gives us spatial imagery there. Because, you know, we know God loves us. Because we know Jesus died for us on the cross. But this word grasp is an important word. And it's a very important part of this prayer. It, the word grasp isn't the same as believe, is it? It means literally to get a hold of something. Uh, which is to, in this case, get a hold of, understand what the Holy Spirit could actually do in you if you let him. In other words, when the Holy Spirit is actually sensitizing your heart, it's not just to hear about how God loves you, you actually grab a hold of it. It grips you. And, and when it grips you, we change our feelings, our thoughts about who we actually are. Let me give you a practical example of what I'm talking about. I'm going to make a we statement here, but this is definitely true of me as a person. I think if we're honest and we have a dialogue about it, we, we would point to a time in our life where we've all questioned our worth after having come to Christ. We've struggled with what we are in our, in our sinful life and, and the ongoingness of it. And the reason we do that is because we've had to acknowledge our sin in order to what? To come to Christ. Uh, if you're taking notes, just write down Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. That's the struggle. It's right there. And in ourselves, we, we're ashamed for much of our past life. And if you're like me, more ashamed of the current life that still struggles with the stuff that I wish was put away. Right? And this is because Paul teaches us, and this is a true fact, of we're all under the power of sin. That's Romans chapter 3. And we've all fallen short of what God had intended for us in creation, right? That's what happened to Adam and Eve. Hey, where are you guys? We're hiding. How come? Yeah. Well, we, we did what you told us not to do. But when we can say to each other, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins, it's very possible, hear this, to have an opinion about that without actually having sensed the power of that truth down inside of our spirit in a way that it changes who we are. This is it. This is Christianity 101 on the practical scale. You want to know what change comes from? It comes from understanding how wide, how high, how deep, how long the love of God is. When that permeates and gets in there, it's not just an idea that you're holding to by faith. It actually takes hold. But we can't sometimes because the shame voice is still part of our identity. We're, we're holding on to the fact that we are children of wrath rather than children of God. And you got to let go. You haven't been set free. You haven't applied what Ephesians chapter 1 through 3 is telling you the way that Paul is praying for you to if you still see life that way. This is the reason why the psalmist 
in the book of Psalms doesn't just say, believe that the Lord is good. No, that's not what he says. What does he say? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience it. It's possible to know about all these things and never have actually encountered them. And I know what you can say, and if you're feeling right now is, well, what does that look like? Well, think firstly, why would he say that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith? When he already said that all Christians already have the Holy Spirit, so, so Christ is dwelling in you by position right now. He wants Christ Jesus to become at least as real to you as any other person in your life. But obviously, he infinitely hopes for more. You know, I was thinking I, 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 of the great loves of humanity, and I think the, the greatest love of humanity that I've ever witnessed is uh, particularly on display um, with, a, with a couple that has their first child, and that mother holds her baby for the first time. And uh, I, I have a picture of my wife with my son at maybe 30 years old, 31 years old when he got married. And, and she has him in an embrace, and they're doing the mother-son da dance, mother-daughter dance, <laughs> mother-son dance. And, and I remember I posted that picture, and I said, there's something about a mama's love. Because just the look on her face and, and holding him. And, and I think of a, a, a mom holding a new more baby. And, and I tell you, when you're talking about the, the height and the depth of the love of God, I want you to understand something, that God loves you more I would say to this mother holding her newborn child, then you can love that baby right now. That's what Paul's getting at here. And to what end? That Jesus' opinion becomes more affecting, more assuring, more real than that anything you could ever get from another human being. That's why David when he wrote his great confession in Psalm 51, after he got uh, confessed about Bathsheba and what he did to her husband Uriah, he said, you alone, Father, have I sinned against. Well, he certainly sinned against Uriah. But what's he saying there? He said, God, you know, at, at my core, my rebellion is against you. Right? And his opinion of God was so great, he cried out in his confession to God from a heart that was in despair. So this is what it must mean when he says, look, I know you already have Christ dwelling in your heart by faith, but I want Christ to actually find a home in, in this heart. I, I want him to be the one you're turning to, is what Paul's saying. Positionally, you got it. You're not going to be cut off. But you can live as a baby Christian your whole life. See, right now you say, I know God loves me, but you don't know how I live or how these people have criticized me. And, then, and much of my life I feel devastated and I feel broken and I feel unworthy and, and I feel like, um, you know, life isn't going the way I want. Sometimes we even turn that into, where are you, God? What's happened here? That, that, that sense of devastation is because you don't know the love of God. You haven't grasped it. You haven't gripped it. I want the truth, Paul says, about what Christ has done for you to dwell in your heart by faith. I want you to actually live if it's true in you, because it is. Until that time, until you grasp that, you, we are living a kind of phony, powerless life where you might not know it, but you're not drawing on it. You know, I mean, you might know it, but you're not drawing on it is what I'm saying. You might kind of know, yeah, just marginal. But look what it says here in verse 19, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. He, it's talking about a, a truly a new kind of life. You used to be seen this way, but now you're seen as something completely different. You know, I've shared this story many times, but, and, and I don't say this. This is not an attaboy for me at all. It just, it just shows you the gods at work. A lot of people that have been around here for years knew me way back when, and they look at me today and they said, how did you get where you're at? I said, God! But I had a buddy here that, well, they're both gone now. 
But a buddy of mine who, who became a believer bought this other buddy of mine. They, these guys were like seven years older than me, but I grew up with him in my, my early 20s in Tahoe, and I was a wild man. And these guys saw that whole scene, and the, the one guy that had been coming here, he had already seen the transition in me. But this other guy came for the first time, this is about 15 years ago, and he saw me preach. And I walked right over here, and as I'm walking out, he steps out of the aisle, and you guys are singing, and, and he puts his hand on it. He goes, he goes, who are you? <laughs> Right? And I got this big smile on my face because I said, uh, I, I am the gift of God, man. What's happened here to me? This, this isn't me. This is what God did in me. Um, and, and I know um, you may be thinking I'm talking about not just knowing certain kinds of truths and bringing them in, but feeling them in my emotions. No, I'm not talking about feeling this in your emotions at all. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm, not, I'm just not talking about feelings here. It's possible to have your feelings aroused. I see it all the time in Christianity and not actually change the way you live. A lot of people can bend their knees, fall down, throw their hands in the air, and do all the outward manifestations of I love God and worship God and then live a life that isn't powerful at all. Paul is saying... If you actually do sense the love of Christ in your heart, it is going to change who you are. You will not be as needy. You certainly will not be fearful about the hard news in life. You will discover you're not nearly as selfish. And the thought of being self-absorbed is a distant memory. You will not be as proud, and you certainly won't be self-loathing anymore because you will be permanently changed. So let's, let's wrap up this message with how do we get it? You know, I'm, I'm always weary of steps to God, right? But these steps, I think, are so important. How do we get this power that Paul's praying for? that we can apply to all these specific reference points in, in our life as human beings that we're going to be talking about over the next three chapters. What can I start doing today? Seek God in prayer regularly. And I, that's really not a good point. It probably should say seek God in prayer regularly about having him fill you. Um, Hudson Taylor... Uh, you may have heard that name. He, he founded the China Inland Mission. He came from Great Britain. He was this great missionary to China. Uh, he opened up China to the gospel in the, the latter half of the 18th century, so like 1850 to, you know, n nearly 1900. And uh, he did what no one in Britain wanted him to do. He lived among the Chinese who Britain had if you look at the history, abused for the sake of their tea. And uh, they thought of them as second-class citizens, and they're there to serve the British, right? He went and lived like a Chinese among the Chinese. He dressed like them. He followed their practice of culture, uh, and he brought Christ to them. The church that exists in China today, some over 50 million Christians, um, even greater than that, they say now, uh, was a result of the work that Hudson Taylor did. He had one of these little prayers he prayed virtually every day. It was in his journal. It was this little poem. And the first line of the prayer was, Oh, Jesus, make thyself to me a living, bright reality. He said that every day. It's, it's part of the way of becoming receptive to what Paul's asking for us in prayer. And I'll tell you, you, you know, I prayed this prayer last night when I woke up in the middle of the night. I, I said, I don't expect it to be answered every day. I, you don't even expect it to be an answer necessarily every year, right? But you do need to regularly say, Lord, I am open to your fullness in my life. And I know that's not going to come without some cost. Because there's things in me that need to change. 
So regular, sustained, seeking prayer, brief but constant, asking God as Paul's asking for us. So how can we have the Spirit of God come in and sensitize our hearts so that we can really have a sense of his love in his life? This is the big one. Obedience. Do what he says. And I'm going to categorize this in two ways for you. The first way is there's no use in saying, well, over here, there's this part of my life in which I'm doing something I know isn't right. Oops, happened again, right? I really shouldn't. And then somehow I'm going to find the power to sit down and say, Lord, fill me with your fullness. It won't happen. It's lackluster faith. It's presumptive faith. It's powerless faith. Agonizing over one's sin faith is always where change begins. Always. When you, when you hear about revival, that's revival. That's where revival breaks out. When you know God is God and he's on his throne and he loves you beyond anything you can imagine and you're treading on him and you go, I, I, I can't do that anymore. That's where change begins. Because you will kneel in your hearts either to yourself and your own authority or to his. There's no middle ground. You'll do one or the other. So how do I obtain an obedient life? How do I do that? Well, let me tell you, God gave you a great resource. He calls it the church. Where if we actually believe what Jesus did for us, we find brothers and sisters. And we can, if we develop relationships, confess to one another. I'll tell you this. If you're not confessing struggle, you're missing out. You're, you're, you're missing out. But in order to confess struggle and be honest about your life, I, I, I love Rex who said this for years. That it comes out of the AA program. You know, once that secret passes your lips, it loses its power. It does. I, I went through this journey. The biggest struggle and the biggest shame I had in my life was lust. It took me... Three years to let that cross my lips to another Christian brother about my struggle. I was amazed at the power that went out of that sin in my life when I did that. All of a sudden, I'm talking about it all the time. And next thing I know, I'm working on it. And the next thing I know, God is healing me. Amen. It's, it works, but it takes a community. You can't do it without others. And I want you to notice this. He doesn't say, I want you to have power just to grasp how wide and how long, how high and deep the love of Christ is. No. Notice what he says there in the actual verse. I pray that you being rooted and established in his love, have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, long, high and deep is the love of Christ. The love is what changes you. Not rules, because I'm using the word obedience. What's the point of obedience? Rules aren't for God. They're for you. Rules are for you to check your heart against the love of God. God's going to love you whether you follow the rules or not once you've come to Christ. But you're not going to grow and you're not going to gain. What did Jesus say? Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. There's something happening on the other side that you get to work on in this life right now. Don't go in as a two-year-old Christian after 50 years. You still go in. You do this in community so much better than you can as an individual. When somebody says, I, I, you know, I just need to go out in the cathedral of God's nature. I don't need church with a bunch of hypocrites. Well, the only church you're ever going to find is a bunch of hypocrites, <laughs> you know. There, you got no option there, you know. And you can only do this in the community. You can't do this as an individual. And, and, and here's, here's where community fails. We, we don't recognize that grasping the love of God requires that we be with people who are not like me. I'm amazed at how many people, you know, get their panties in a bunch because somebody in the church offends them, you know. Or the pastor didn't agree with my opinion, and I'm going to go find a pastor who does. You know, that's not community. That's consumerism. I'm going to go to the store that has the products that I want. 
Well, let me tell you, if you want to grow, you've got to live in a store that doesn't have the products you want. That's how life brings growth to you. The depths of, to the love of God that are impossible to experience without regularly surrounding yourself with people who are not like you. That's how God grows us. What do you think happens in marriage? I always say opposites attract. How is that a formula for success? It, it's not in the sense if you're selfish and self-absorbed, it won't work. But if you're living in community with your spouse, it's what? She's sharpening me and I'm sharpening her. Right? That's why um, next week, and I'm, I'm stealing a little Corbett's thunder here. This gets the... the to me, the best passage in Ephesians, always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. And why do you have love? Because Christ first loved you. So when he says, I want you to grasp the love of God, and he gives us a spatial arrangement. What, What Paul is saying is, I want you literally Though you have it positionally to wrestle with the intensity of his love. And he uses these these four uh, descriptions of how to test God's love. So, here's what it comes to. Only when you understand the gospel that you are saved by grace in spite of being a sinner. This is (laughs) Ephesians chapter 2. You're not saved by what you do, by but what Jesus has done. Not on the basis of your performance and, and good works. You are saved by what? The sheer grace and love of God. He wants to be merciful to you, not because you deserved it. Because he wants to love you. And you receive that by faith. It doesn't matter what you've done. If Jesus Christ died on the cross, you're saved by grace alone. Then what? God's love is infinitely wide, isn't it? It embraces anyone who desires it and receives it. That's how wide the love of God is. So let's ask how long the love of God is. And most of us will think, well, as long as I live the life I ought to live, as long as I'm obeying him, then he'll love me. No. This, this is a, I scream about obedience. That's for us, not for God. God's love in Christ by faith will not fail you. That's why Jesus says, I I gave them eternal life, okay? I gave. I give them my gift. That's how they got it. It's a gift. They will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. And I love how he, he adds in verse 29 here in John, my father has given it to me, and guess what? There ain't anybody bigger and stronger on the block, and there never will be. You're not going anywhere. That's why Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, I'm convinced the one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Not may bring it to completion, will. Sadly, for much of our, much of our transition will occur when we pass and he transforms us. But, you know, build on it in this life. That's what Paul's talking about. We're told in Revelation that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. I want to tell you, God put his love on you through time, and he'll never take it off of you. Now, why? Because salvation is by grace. It's not by our works. It's not by what we do. It's because of Jesus' work. It's infinitely wide. It's infinitely long. And why is it? Because it's infinitely deep. If you, under, if you want to understand the depths of the love of God, you look into the depths of what Christ Jesus went to save you. Look to the cross. How deep did he go? He cries out in Aramaic from the cross, one of his sayings, Eloi, Eloi, calling to God, his father. Why hast thou forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? You know why he was forsaken in that moment? Because he was thrown into the deepest pit anybody ever went into. And the sins of the world were poured out on him. And he went voluntarily because of his love for you. 
Because of the gospel, you know God's love is infinitely wide, infinitely long, because it came from an infinitely deep place. And you can't go high until you first go deep. And who went deep for you? So what is the height of God's love? John writes in one of his letters at the end of the New Testament, beloved, we do not know what we will be like. We, what's heaven going to be like? But we know we will be like him. Because when we see him, we will see him as he is, and then we will know. The height of God's love is he is sharing the glory of his son, the name above all names, with us. He's going to give us the same thing that fills his heart with infallible joy from all eternity. With the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit shared for all eternity, he's going to show us his glory and he's going to give that glory to us. Read Ephesians chapter 1 verses 18 through 22. It's all there. Can you think of any love higher than that? Only if you can understand the gospel of Jesus Christ can you understand the width, the length, the depth, and the height of God's love for you. That's what changes you. So let's close in prayer as we congratulate God for what he can do and what he is doing. And I am going to join my brother John in closing with the doxology that is at the end of this great chapter. Bow with me in prayer. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. Ushers, 1030 discussion group. God bless you guys for making it out. Be safe going home. What a great truth to live on today, huh? Amen. Amen. stand with us. We're going to sing glory to God forever. He is worthy of our praise.
Have a blessed week, everybody. We'll sing this benediction over you as you as you leave. Now to God who is able to do.